Good morning. Thank you so much, Sarah. It is my esteemed honor to introduce the keynote speaker this morning, um, my friend, my co-author, and my collaborator, uh, David Houle. A little quick background about David. Uh, David started his career in marketing, publishing, broadcasting in Chicago uh, with CBS, and that was in the 70s until some of his friends uh, called to him and said this new thing called cable television uh, is interesting and wouldn't it be cool to combine um, rock music with cable television and David was on the uh, founding team thereafter for uh, MTV. Uh, this man from Atlanta, Ted Turner, had started CNN at the time uh, following uh, David's connections with MTV and he then went on to help Ted Turner launch Headline News and thereafter went to uh, Nickelodeon and many other uh, great organizations that really set trends and, and new uh, beginnings for uh, this country in, in many different spaces. He is now a world-renowned futurist, has published many, many books in addition to the one that we published together, The New Health Age, um, a brand shift, shift ed, um, the, um, many, many others. So it is with my uh, heart and, and warm welcome that I welcome David Houle, futurist, strategist, to the stage this morning. Thank you, David. Thank you. So uh, it's a thrill to be here. Uh, number one, I have never done this presentation before. So you always remember the first time, right? Um, second of all, it's the hometown crowd. And I want to acknowledge Sarah and Stan because it was about two and a half years ago they first met and, and uh, this woman could not stop talking about her vision for creating a conference in Sarasota Bradenton and creating a conference anywhere is difficult. So you've come a long way and so it's, it's an honor to finally be on your stage, thank you. Um, and also, I'm a local, uh, I split my, uh, when I'm not on a plane flying around the world, I'm in Evanston, Illinois, and Sarasota, Florida, but uh, in about seven months, I'm going to become a full-time resident of Sarasota and a, and a Florida resident as well. Um, so I am uh, also the futurist in residence and guest lecturer at the Ringling College of Art and Design. And so I guest lecture there. <laughs> Um, and, and do things that President Thompson wants me to do. Um, and so when I was guest lecturing, uh, I started going to, uh, uh, you can see, uh, so David Hull and Tim Rummage. I started meeting Tim Rummage. Tim Rummage is head of environmental studies at Ringling. And, you know, beyond guest lecturing, I would always go to his classes because to me, as a guy who's always been about uh, environment and alternative energy, quickly predicting the price of oil and things like that. Tim was the most brilliant guy I'd ever met uh, in environment. So, Tim, if you'd want to stand up. He, here he's my co-author, Tim Rummage from the Ringling College of Art and Design. And, and, and while he is still standing, the thing I always like to say is, can you pick who is the futurist and who is the planetary ethicist? <laughs> okay. So, the science I've learned from Tim. And I speak all around the world about the future. And to me, starting today, this might be a pivot in, in my career for the rest of my life. Uh, uh, I grew up reading the great futurists of the last century, Alvin Toffler, Buckminster Fuller, and Marshall McLuhan. And so for people who, who are um, more academic oriented or of a certain age, those names resonate. So, so I very proudly and humbly stand on their shoulders looking into this century. Okay, so that's, and, and so I've always talked about Toffler because I talk about the shift age. But in the two years that I've come to become very good friends with Tim and sit at his feet and listen and learn, uh, I have realized that, some, uh, that I have to talk about something different. In 1969, Buckminster Fuller wrote a book called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And he said, we live on Spaceship Earth, but we do not have an operating manual. A couple of years later, uh, Marshall McLuhan said, there are no passengers on Spaceship Earth. We are all crew. 
And then Fuller said in the early 70s, in several decades, which I translate to be right here, right now, humanity is going to be a fork in the road, utopia or oblivion. So that's the high-level metaphor for where I stand in my life today because I've, I, I've made a lot of money, made a lot of friends, spoken in all six continents around the world, talking about how we can create utopia in this transformative time. But I truly believe, and that's why I wrote this book with Tim, is that climate change is really oblivion. That if we don't change our consciousness, we won't have a civilization by 2100, or the civilization we have will be somewhere like the civilization around the 1700s. And I say that with full belief. So, so I, w when we were working, and I, w and I went online, and I, could, I found I could get thisspaceshipearth.org as a URL. That was it, because that was, that was the whole thing. So that shaped our thinking. And, and, and so with that, I want to I start this presentation with, with some quotes. And these are the motivational quotes. So, so as an as a old guy who was a futurist, as a young man, I, I had instilled in me this, this concept that Earth is a spaceship, okay? So, first of all, Buckminster Fuller, we're not going to be able to operate our spaceship Earth successfully, nor for much longer, unless we see it as a whole spaceship and our fate as common. It has to be everybody or nobody. Marshall McLuhan, there are no passengers in Spaceship Earth, we are all crew. Once a photograph of the Earth taken from the outside is available, a new idea as powerful as any in history would be let loose. The interesting thing is he used the word outside because he spoke in 1948, right? Nobody had been in space. And this last one, you develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scuff of the neck and drag him a quarter million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. From Edgar Mitchell, who just left us two weeks ago. He was a great man, great visionary. And he, he, had, a, he had a spiritual transformation from being on the moon. So, this spaceship Earth, what is happening in the atmosphere today hasn't happened for 800,000 years. The reason is that's significant is that we, modern humanity, have been on this planet for 200,000 years, which means that there is nothing in our playbook, nothing in our thinking, nothing even in our DNA to have us deal with what is happening, which is why nobody really has their handle on it. And, and people, you know, question it. Well, obviously you're going to question something that's never existed in human history. So there's no precedence for what's occurring. So to me, as somebody who has lived this life and been of this orientation, if there's something that is totally new, that nobody has any experience about, you have to change your consciousness to be able to first to understand what it is. So change of consciousness is the first step. I feel so committed to this, and Tim feels so committed to this, that we've just set up, with, with, the, with the help of uh, Blalock Walters, Jonathan's law firm, a nonprofit corporation in the state of Florida to create a global-facing, thisspaceshipearth.org nonprofit based in Sarasota to create crew consciousness on the planet. So, so we have to move from unaware cruise ship mentality to spaceship crew consciousness. Now, think about being on a cruise ship, for those of you who have. You don't know where the food came from. You don't know if they throw the waste over the, over the side. You don't really know anything about it. You're disconnected from everything that is your experience or that you consume. That's cruise ship consciousness. Silos, we all use that. It was used numerous times yesterday and lack of connectedness to everything being interconnected. When you create silos, when you create separateness, the single greatest thing that I really learned from Tim was his, his mastery of the deep understanding of the interconnectedness of every single thing on Spaceship Earth. So, so that's what we have to do. And this simple phrase, everybody is downwind or downstream from somebody else, because we've got 7.3 billion passengers on Spaceship Earth, right? So you have Fukushima, 
in, in March of 2011, and in, and, and in 2012, you know, the albacore tuna becomes radioactive in the Pacific, and, and, and we start getting the, 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 the stuff from Japan washing up on the, on the shores of California and Alaska, 2013, 2014. So, so this, this feeling that we live in a vacuum that what we, you know, the air that we pollute here in Bradenton, somebody's going to breathe in Fort Lauderdale tomorrow, right? So, this isn't, this take a little explanation. So we live on one planet, but today humans use the equivalent of 1.5 planets of resources to provide, what well, to support our standard of living. So in other words, it takes the Earth 18 months to regenerate what we use in 12 months. So go to the metaphor of a spaceship, right? You're on a spaceship. Anybody, you know, seen Martian? Yeah, right. Okay. So that whole figuration, okay, we can go back. We've got this amount of supplies in the sand. You think that way if you're on a spaceship. So if you're on a spaceship and you're going to Mars and halfway there, you're consuming more than one, one unit of what is on that spaceship, in other words, you're consuming 50% over your supplies, you're in the red zone. We've been operating in the red zone since 1970. 1970 is when we crossed over 1.0. So 1.0 equals consuming resources for one year from the planet. Or less than, right? Because we want to have sustainability. But not all footprints are equal. This is a per capita footprint. So what this means is the United States consumes at the level of five planets. And since World War II, we've done such a great job of selling the American way of life that Europe, post-World War II, said, we want to do that too. And China, starting in the 1990s, said, oh, we want to do that too. And the, and, and, and the issue around climate change is we're saying, oh, wait, wait a minute, you can't do that because, because you're polluting. And they're saying to us, well, you sold us. This is the way to do it. We want to do it as well. So, so if everybody on the planet consumed at the level that the people in this room consume, we need five planets of resources. And we're not even sure how long that would last us, a few centuries perhaps, right? Now, China is the number one polluter. Of course, they have four times as many people, and this is per capita, but they're also in the early stage, so they're using the cheapest stuff, which is coal. So they're the number one polluter in terms of car, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We're number two. I think India's three. And, and, and look at the UK. So the reasons these are smaller is uh, because of the per capita. And I've spoken to so many people, you know, because I travel the world talking, yeah, it's China's fault. It's the Chinese. No, they're just doing what we sold them, right? So, so, you know, that's the thing. And to put this in perspective, usually, you know, yesterday there were bottles of water up here, okay? One million plastic water bottles, the amount not recycled in the U.S. every 15 minutes. Drink it, throw it away. So, I was hoping there were bottles of water up here so I could show, I'm showing up, with crew consciousness, right? I bring my own water. No, I actually brought the thing and I filled the water up so I can drink my water without throwing away a plastic thing. In fact, I mean, that's not your fault, I'm not blaming you, because there isn't crew consciousness in the room. What I want to do, what we want to do with our nonprofit is create crew consciousness conferences, right? You know, you can see it, we got a, we got a great logo, and we want conferences around the world to say, we are a crew conscious conference. What does that mean? It means if you want to drink water, bring your own vessel. If you don't bring it, well, you can buy bottled water for $2 and maybe give the money to a nonprofit that's trying to create crew consciousness, right? So, so just think of that. Out of sight, out of mind. You roll your garbage out, to the front of your house, I do it on Monday evenings because they pick up on Tuesday, and it's taken away. So our consciousness is, oh, the garbage is gone. It's still on Spaceship Earth, it's just gone somewhere else, right? So we're so siloed in our personal thinking that it's like, oh, got rid of the garbage. You didn't get rid of the garbage, it was just moved somewhere. It's still on the spaceship, right? 
Everybody in this room, if you're like an average American, produces 17 tons of carbon emissions a year. Every single person in this room, if you live an American life and you drive a car and you have air conditioning. Now, you didn't know that. That wasn't your intent. But this is how we've been because we think passengers. We're siloed. So, so, so this is a result of that. Now, CO2. We all know CO2, right? I want, here's what I want you to understand the scale of this. 8,000 BC. So this is basically the agricultural age. It's basically all of recorded history when all the civilizations and all the religions of the world were created. And, you know, it's pretty much been here. The industrial age began right here, and then look what happened. The earlier stuff has, has come from ice core, and since the mid-50s, this has been the general source of, of measuring CO2. Look at that. Unprecedented. Un it is precedented, by the way. And when it's happened this high, there have been five extinctions events since the Earth began. We are creating the sixth extinction event. Because you put 16 tons of CO2 in the air every year, you, not just this room, but you're part of the larger global, that means there are 158 species today that will go extinct. Every day there's 158 species going extinct because of human activity. Now let's focus in a little closer. So this is from the beginning of the industrial age to 2010. Raise your hand if you've heard of 350.org. Okay, a few of you, okay. So the concept there by Bill McGibbon, great, brilliant environmentalist, great leader, uh, was we have to get back to 350, 350 parts per million. So, you know, we cross that somewhere around uh, in the 80s, right? And we went over it. But because we're going over it so much more, going back to 350 is not enough. And I'll explain that in just a minute. So now, uh, here, July 2013, 2014, 2015, as of July 2015, 401. It was 250 to 270 before the Industrial Revolution. Tim sent me the slide last night. Here's where it is last month, 402.5, parts per million. Unprecedented. Now, we all think about CO2, but there's other gases. Methane, methane is 28 times, creates 20, is 28 more times more powerful than CO2 in terms of holding heat and keeping heat. And look at this. Again, birth of Christ, here's where we are, off the top. So this is 28 times more heat generating or retaining than CO2. If you've watched the news for the last few months, you know the methane leak in LA? That's gonna have a transformative effect somewhere on the planet. It has 28 times more power to retain heat than CO2. So, the problem of everybody in this room and most people on the planet is CO2 is invisible. CO2 is invisible. So you don't see it. So Tim and his teaching came up with this visual, and it is now, it, it, the, the metrics have changed. I didn't create a new slide that you sent me last night. So what if CO2 had the visual impact of a four-ton African elephant? By the way, we use in our book, T-O-N and T-O-N-N-E. T-O-N-N-E is a metric ton, which is bigger than the tons that we have, and most of the world is metric. So what if CO2 could be trans translated into elephants? Then the CO 2012, the, what's the number for 2015? Uh, 315. 315. So in 2015, the CO2 emissions would be equivalent of launching 315 elephants, four ton elephants, per second into the air every second for an entire year. That's how much CO2 is going into the atmosphere. So this is Paris, right? floating over our heads an ever-increasing number of dec for decades, generations, centuries, and millennia. Surely that would promote a more in-depth concern. If we walked, if, if after this morning, we went, walked out of this hall, 
And you know, there are 500 four-ton elephants floating in the air. Don't you think we'd, ha- we'd think we'd have an issue with that? But because it's invisible, can't see it, don't believe it. Seeing is believing, right? So, you know, and we, and, and we can do this with it. It's imagined. So, so to take it even further. Um, let me just set this up and then we can play the video. Did anybody see this brilliant documentary? It was on Discovery a couple months ago called Racing Extinction. Racing Extinction. You have to see it. It will make you happy. It will make you angry. It will make you depressed. It's about how we are trying, we need to change fast enough to protect ourselves from extinction. As Tim always says, and we have lots, you know, by the way, this, you know, it's all in this book. And the interesting thing about this book is that it took us a year and a half to write it. And in the year and a half we wrote it, the dynamics and the economics kept changing. So we said, we can't keep writing a book that's going to be out of date. So we made this kind of the, uh, for those of you that are old enough, you know, like the little red book of the, of the, of the uh, cultural revolution. Here's the basics you need to know about climate change. And the companion website, the nonprofit website, will always be updated. We have chapter two in here is called the Quartermaster's Report. Quartermaster is the person who states the status of the ship at any point in time. So we're going to have on the website Quartermaster's Update from this book. And we're selling it one third off out there and they've all been signed, okay? So this is from Racing Extinction. And when I saw this, I said, I got we have to put it up. So if we could play the video, please. I could see the power of an image. It was transformative. I think it's in our DNA to take care of future generations. And if you can find that, that way in, you can reach people really quickly and change them. The human eye is so limited we see only a tiny little sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's like if you owned a grand piano in your house, but you could only hear one note on it. Normally, carbon dioxide gas is invisible to the human eye, but certain wavelengths of infrared will be absorbed by gases like CO2 or methane. So that's what's going on here. This camera has a very particular color filter on it, enabling us to visualize the CO2 gas that's coming out of our noses and mouths. We have two cameras, one camera that sees what your eye sees, and the other, what the fossil fuel companies don't want the rest of the world to see, the carbon dioxide world. Let's do this one coming at us. I mean, it's disgusting, but it's beautiful. Just about everything that we do emits carbon dioxide. And the way we heat and air condition our houses, the way we to our transportation systems, whether it's planes, trains, or automobiles. Just about everything pumps out vast amounts of carbon dioxide. But you can't see it. To be able to see this hidden world was like you were let in on this magic trick. But the magic trick is actually killing the planet. This looks like a big parade of crap, doesn't it? Just filth. Here comes the man. Uh-oh. So what are you working on, buddy? Come on in, I will show you. Is this your right. flux capacitor? It's uh, close. It's, uh, right here, actually. I can spin this. You see this? It's just carbon dioxide. I mean, what, the government hiring you? Who's doing it? You just doing an own thing yeah, or what? Yeah, it's like a science project. Science, science project. Science project. In many ways, our generation is the one with the last hand on the throttle that just pushes that throttle down. We're putting so much carbon dioxide 
putting so much methane into the atmosphere. So, that's what it looks like. That's what you can't see, right? So, to put that in perspective, here's the Earth, right? The Earth is 8,000 miles in diameter. So the scale about what I'm to do is not in scale. The atmosphere is 60 miles high. Now, this beautiful thing called Earth, surrounded by the atmosphere in the middle of space, is what keeps life alive on the planet. The atmosphere protects us from meteors. The atmosphere protects us from burning up from the sun. And uh, so e think about all that carbon dioxide I just talked about, and then take it a step further. So if you can't see this, it says civilization three miles. So almost all of civilization has lived from sea level to three miles, rounding up 16,000 feet. So 100%, for the most part, of humanity has lived within three miles of sea level. Isn't it intuitively impossible now that I've shown you just what I've shown you not to think that these that these tons, 37, 38 gigatons of CO2 per year by humanity atmosphere is not going to affect something as thin as this because particulates are heavy. So they're not going to be in the outer part of the atmosphere. They're going to be in the inner part. I mean, how, how can that not affect what's going on on the planet? How can that not heat the planet? So now, so what this is, is, you know, 1880 to 2015, average global temperature, surface temperatures compared to the average of the 20th century. So you'll notice low, 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 warming there, World War II, um, down here. And the interesting thing is there is, a, there is a, a, a scientific chart that maps ice ages, you know, using core samples since the beginning of the planet. And what it predicted, so some, you know, if any of you ever heard of climate change scenario, well, you know, there was supposed to be an ice age in the 70s, you know, and now we're talking about warming. Well, there was supposed to be an ice age in the 70s, and, and you can see it was starting to get colder, but then we ramped up, we overpopulated the planet, families went from one car to three cars, planes flew everywhere, and we created this. How can you not say the planet's not warming, right? And, 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 not only is it warming, but this is when the ice age is supposed to kick in. So we have overruled one of the rhythms of the planet that has gone on since the beginning of the planet. Finance. So, whoops. So, whoops, I gotta go back. Why is this? Okay, here we go. So, the global GDP is the aggregate of all the GDPs of all the, country in the countries in the world. And this is 2013. So that 75 trillion is what is the measured economic activity for humanity. But the ecosystem is much bigger. In other words, when the GDP is measured, the water used, oh, that's for us to use. We don't need to measure it as a cost. Or the oxygen we breathe, we don't need to measure it. Or the bees that pollinate the crops that we can now sell are not measured. So in reality, we're not measuring in this GDP the support mechanisms of the planet. So that's why we don't think of this stuff because it has, we, we think in economic terms. We're born, to get a, we're born and raised and trained to, to work, right? Work, make money, do all that stuff. That's in this, but this is supported by this. So what if Coca-Cola had, had to incorporate as a cost all the water that the planet is letting it do for free, right? Or the, the farmers had to pay for those bees, right? So, so this is another way to look at it. Now, so raise your hand if you do not know what Davos stands for, what it means. It's okay if you don't. Okay, a couple of them. So Davos happens the end of January every year. It's the meeting of the World Economic Forum, meaning all the central bankers, lots of heads of states, all the CEOs of the big banks around the world, wannabes, go to Davos. So these, these are the big global brains about economics and finance, right? 
Okay. And every year, they put out something called the five global risks in terms of likelihood, risks to the global economy, because this is an economic convention. So every year, they put out five, and they've been doing it since they began. So here's 2012, here's 2016. Now what I'm going to do is show you this slide relative to climate change. Everything in red is oriented towards climate change. So it's interesting to note that in 2012, rising greenhouse gas emissions and water supply crisis. So there were two. 2013, rising greenhouse gas, water supply, same thing. 2014, extreme weather events. Climate is weather. Climate change. 2015, extreme weather events. State collapse. Uh, basically, it was just this one, an interstate conflict with regional consequences. This is happening because of drought, lack of water, lack of food. So people are fighting over water now. The largest aquifer in Asia sits 50% under Pakistan and 50% under India. How's that going to work out, right? Look at 2016. So this is a month old. 2016, large scale involuntary migration. Okay, we have all read about the migrate, migration refugee problem from Syria, right? A million refugees in 2015. Our forecast is that by 2025, right around there, there will be 10 times that per year due to climate change. If you live in a place that's been in drought for 10 years, you leave. If you live uh, at zero sea level, your home will be underwater. So think about that. Climate change is going to create 10 times the refugee problem that we had last year, OK? Extreme weather events. Failure of climate change mitigation and adaption. That's why I want to do this. I'm the only futurist who's out here wanting to do this. If you go back and think about where you get your climate change information, it's usually from environmental scholar, climate change scientist, or an advocacy group, but not a futurist. I mean, I'm here saying it would be a professional dereliction of duty for me as a, as, for me as a futurist to not talk about climate change, okay? because that is the one thing that can really disrupt society, society and civilization, okay? Interstate conflict with regional consequences, mentioned that, and major natural catastrophes. This hasn't been fully plotted enough that I can talk about it, but doesn't it feel that there's ever more natural catastrophes? And how about the unnatural natural catastrophes? You know, this is not talked about relative to fracking. Fracking. One of the headquarters of fracking in the world is Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, up to about 20 years ago, had zero earthquakes. Last year, Oklahoma City had more earthquakes than any other city in the world. Granted, they were like one to two on the Richter scale, but two weeks ago, they had a 5.1 earthquake in Oklahoma City. And the only correlation is fracking. Okay? So, so one of these great things, so when you hear this pretty little woman who's on TV going, oh, natural gas, natural gas is really cleaner, they don't say, you know, it's not like the prescription drugs, which then have to say all the downsides, but it will call or cause earthquake. It will pollute your drinking water. They don't have to say that, right? It, but that's what's happening. So here's Anthropocene. I've been talking about it for years. Anthropocene means human. In other words, we are now in the Anthropocene era because humans have the greatest impact on the planet of anything. So we're now in the human era of the Earth's history. And you see where it says present? That one capital I represents the entire time that humanity has been on the planet. So it began 4.5, and it's got another 3 billion. So this kind of old cliched, save the planet, recycle. We're not saving the planet, right? The planet's going to be here until the, earth blo the sun blows up in about 3 billion. This does nothing to do about the planet. We're not saving the planet. We're trying to save ourselves and all the species that we're killing, right? So just look in the perspective. Um, this is the entire time humanity's been on the planet. Another way to say it is if you took a 25-foot rope representing the beginning of Earth to now, and you added a penny on the end, 
That's the time Homo sapiens have been on the planet. Just to put that in perspective. So we think, the, so all of these come up. If you really think about things in life, you think about relationships, you think about bad situations, it starts with forgiveness, right? You have to forgive before you can move on. So we call this book This Spaceship Earth because it is this spaceship Earth right here, right now. Here's the state of the planet. We have to give, forgive Henry Ford for producing cars. He didn't know he was going to cause smog in L.A., with millions of cars, he was producing thousands of cars. We have to forgive John D. Rockefeller for, for scaling up oil to power progress, because he didn't know it was gonna affect the polar bear's habitat. Very much more difficultly, still hard for me to do, we have to forgive ExxonMobil for knowing that they were creating climate change in the 60s and 70s, and burying, not only burying that, science, but saying the opposite. We have to forgive because we can't go back. So the first thing we have to do as a, as a species is forgive ourselves for what has happened. You have to forgive yourself for having put 16 tons of carbon into the air last year, because here's where we are. So at the end of this presentation, at the end of this book, we say, so now you know what you're going to do, right? No, it, it, the job is to end the ignorance around this, okay? So then, once we forgive, we have to face forward, just like in a relationship. You've forgiven each other, now we move on with our life. So here is where we are. We have to face forward with the degraded planet we got, with all the, the tens of thousands of species we've already killed off, and what are we going to do, right? So TSC is the state, this spaceship Earth, we use that as an abbreviation, is the state of the planet today. We start from here and now. So none of this, you know, in a, in a nation that's so polarized, well, you are from the oil and you're from this, and da, 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 natural gas, I mean, end that intramural conflict and we gotta unite and move forward. In 2012, I wrote a book, Entering the Shift Age, and I coined the phrase Earth Century. It's no longer an Earth Day, an Earth Month, an Earth Year, an Earth Decade. It's the Earth Century. And I wrote in 2012, and I quote, we've quoted a lot in the book, because why rewrite it, that this is the century, the 21st century, is the century where humanity has to commit to its relationship to the planet. It can either choose to live, we, as humanity, we can live the way we want to live and know that our grandchildren, know that our children, may, may, our grandchildren for sure won't know what a beach is, right? Our grandchildren for sure won't know what a butterfly is, right? So, so this is, the, and, and the reason, in, in the research that Tim and I did, the reason we have this up here is, I used to say when I talked about climate change, say even five years ago, by 2100, what would happen to your mind? You'd check out, oh, I'm not going to be alive. Now I can speak to students at Ringling who are 18 to 23, and I go, in your lifetime, this is going to be the single largest challenge, problem, issue, opportunity. It's going to shape your generation. This is the issue. This is the innovative opportunity for the millennial generation. Because coincidentally, as I'm about to show you, the warming of the planet coincided, it was coincidental with the adulthood of the baby boomers, okay? So what we're saying is we have to do a radical change in consciousness in this 15-year period to even have an opportunity for the rest of the century to not go into unimaginable catastrophes and chaos. Okay, so what does this mean? We are a 730 species living in a 1230 world. Now, pause. It's okay to write a book about climate change but you gotta add to the science. And this is, this is, this is what, what Tim and I came up with. It's not parts per million. It's gigatons of resident CO2 in the atmosphere. Fact, when CO2 goes up into the atmosphere, it stays there for decades, centuries, even millennia, right? So once it goes up, it doesn't go away, it hangs there. So the aggregation, so the key metric is resident CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, here is a picture of it. Again, beginning of the industrial age. 
So, you know, and pretty much this would be constant if you went back 10,000 years. A little more than 700. Pretty much stayed the same. Look what happened. It, 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 it crossed 800 right around World War II. It, 1970 is a really interesting turning point, right? 1970 was the first Earth Day. It was the year after man's first step foot on the moon. It was two years after the first picture taken from space of, of uh, the Earth. And look what's happened, okay? We've gone from being a 730 species to a 1,230 species of resident gigatons in, in, in the atmosphere, right? So... Most of you have read about the Paris Accord, right, which was December. Historic in the sense that you got nation states to agree on anything. What they agreed to do starting in 2020 with no specifics as to how it was going to be done said, we're going to decrease fossil fuel emissions by 2% a year starting in 2020. So that's what this would look like in terms of tons of, you know, gigatons into the atmosphere. Here's where we are, and, and it goes down 2%, right, by 2050. Oh, that sounds pretty good. We're reducing the amount we're putting up. But remember, it's not what we're putting up, it's what's already up there that we're adding to. So the amount of annual, uh, annual amount of CO2 added to the atmosphere by the Paris plan. So yeah, sure, in 2020, uh, this is the billion tons, and it keeps going down, but it's still added. So it's not like we're doing good, we're just doing bad more slowly, okay? So remember, we went from 830 to 1230 in, in 45 years. So, and, and that's when the warming occurred. To go back a sec, this is congruent time-wise with the warming of the planet and, and the climate changing, okay? So somewhere around here, over 830, is where we start over-impacting the planet. So here is the normal line, and if we just followed the Paris Accord, assuming everybody did what they're supposed to do, we would go from 1,200 to 1,800. So we'd increase resident CO2 by another 600 gigatons. And look at the disruption that 400 has caused. So instead, in our book, we've come up with a suggested plan. For, so this is the Paris Accord, and this is the Paris plan plus the spatial birth reduction plan to get back down to here as soon as possible. So, in 1970, 830 gigatons of resident CO2 in the, environment, in the atmosphere. 2015, 1230. So that's 45 years. So the goal for our species should be to, in the next 45 years, get it back down to here, which means that instead of 350.org, the new metric that needs to be the metric that our species mobilizes around is 830 gigatons as soon as possible. If we don't do this, a lot of bad things will happen, okay? And, and uh, um, I didn't have enough time today, but it's real simple to do. There's over a trillion dollars of subsidies around the world going to the fossil fuel industry. One, thousand, one trillion dollars of subsidies or costs to repair oil spills and stuff like that paid for by governments. If you just move the thousand we're giving to the old type of energy and moved it to the new, it's not like, you know, uh, a climate, well, it's gonna cost. Climate change won't cost anything if we just think differently, right? Change our consciousness. Why do we have to spend a trillion dollars a year globally to subsidize the fossil fuel industry when if we put it towards renewable and alternative, we could change much more quickly. So it's not like we're building, okay? Um, I wrote a column last September, and I'm about, you know, it's on my blog. You can go to my blog, davidhull.com, and read it. I said that I thought that 2015 might be the peak year of fossil fuel use and fossil fuel emissions. And, 
and I'm writing a, a, a really long thought piece in my newsletter, which uh, probably go out week after next, where I'm saying that 2015 to 2017 will be looked back on as the transition or the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era, which will go on for several decades. But think what that means. If, if I'm right, and I think I'm right, I've been pretty right about energy projections and price of oil and stuff, then by 2020, the conversation on CNBC is, so, Mr. ExxonMobil, you have now become a short-term investment. Your days are over. You have two choices, the Wall Street, the street, the money is going to start talking to the fossil fuel industry and saying, hey, you have two things to do. Either increase your dividends, so it's still a comfortable stock to own for retirement, or you spend your money on the only part of energy that's in a double-digit growth mode, which is alternative renewable. So, this is, so the fossil fuel industry is probably going to do the latter rather than because they're cutting back now, right? This is the first, that's why all this, the, as an aside, all the prognosticators today about the glut and the price of oil, it's going to be looked back on as the trigger moment of the beginning of the decline of the fossil fuel era. Because there are only four countries in the world, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, that can produce at a profit under $30 a barrel, which means Russia, Venezuela, Nigeria, all of which are having economic upheavals, are still pumping it out at a loss because they need the cash flow. Think how long, it's, we're never gonna see $100 a barrel oil again. We, we're not gonna see $60 a barrel oil again, at least until the end of next year. So what Saudi Arabia and those countries are doing is they're driving down the price because they know the fossil fuel era is over. And so they're driving down the price to dry out, drive out the fracking industry in the United States, to get Nigeria out of the way, to get Russia maybe out of the way or not out of the way, depending on the, the military deals that go on in the Middle, in the Middle East. And, and so then when the developed countries are on um, uh, renewables, they control the price for the developing countries of the world going forward. So it's a historical moment. So what do we have to do? This is chapter eight of the book. Chapter eight of the book is what is we in the collective we, humanity has to do and do as soon as possible. Chapter nine is what you individually can do, okay? So I'm just gonna talk about the we right now. So we have to define sustainability as operating this spaceship Earth at 1.0 or less than 1.0. Any other definition of sustainability is a contrived, contained. Oh, this building is sustainable. Okay, but that doesn't help anything. We have to move back from a 1.5, 1.6 down to a 1.0 or less. And since we've been operating at over 1.0, since we've been consuming more resources on the spaceship, than the spaceship has since 1970, logic dictates we have to go below 1.0 to catch up the deficit, right? So that's the first thing we have to do. We have to redefine sustainability to a global level. Anything less than that doesn't matter anymore. We have to decrease fossil fuel uses ASAP. That's happening. There's a convergence of trends that means it's the beginning of the fossil fuel industry. Cars, you know, Tesla, right? No fossil fuel. At the car I drive, I drive a Hyundai. I get 30 miles to the gallon in the city, right? So everything, and alternative renewable energy has come down to the same cost as fossil fuels in terms of creating electricity. Plus, we know about climate change. So all of this is impacting fossil fuels are bad. Use less of it. The autonomous car, the autonomous electric car, right? Carbon tax. Obama said, I want to put a $10 tax on a barrel of oil. He should put a $50 tax. Anybody who is against that is a, is a climate change denier. I mean, I don't, I, am, I, I don't speak about politics, but it seems to me, as I've, 10 years ago, I got climate change deniers. Now the only climate change deniers that I'm aware of seem to be running for president on the Republican side. Oh, it's just bad weather, right? I mean, come on. So carbon tax, absolutely. Correlation, cigarettes, seatbelts. People said, I don't need to wear a seatbelt. And that became the law. Cigarettes, doesn't affect me. Smoking industry says it doesn't affect me. Then it started getting taxed. 
There's a direct correlation if you look at cigarettes from the 1950s to now on the decrease of the population, adult population smokes, it's a direct correlation to the amount of tax. <clears throat> Completely rethink agriculture. This is what we were talking about last night. Agriculture creates more greenhouse gas emissions than all the transportation on the planet because of the way we have created industrialized agriculture. When, you know, cow dung is methane, and it used to be, it'd be out in the fields, which would act as fertilizer to grow a menu off the ground rather than corn as far as the mile can see. So we have to rethink agriculture. Vertical agri think about vertical agriculture, right? That's the next thing. Indoor agriculture, take, a, take every single vacant big box store that exists in the United States and make it hydroponic vertical uh, agriculture. <clears throat> Number one, three crops per year. Number two, no insecticides or pesticides because it's inside. And three, it's close to where it's gonna be consumed so you don't have the carbon of transport. You go shopping in Publix in this town, and half the stuff has been brought in from California on transport that is putting fossil fuels into the air. So rethink agriculture. <clears throat> A global effort to redesign and retrofit buildings. Still, if we retrofitted and redesigned buildings, we could save 25% energy. Every single building that was built in the 20th century could be retrofitted to save 25% energy. So there we go. Um, move to a this spaceship Earth consciousness on population growth, right? If you think passengers and crew. Pope Francis is a transformative pope, and he is completely saying climate change, we have to address it because it disproportionately affects the poor. The one thing he has yet to say is one of the causes of climate change is overpopulation. So when the Catholic Church comes out for birth control, then he is staking a stance on climate change. Because 100 years ago, there was 1.3 billion. Now there's 7.3. The car was invented when there was 1.3 billion. Now there was, there was uh, 3 million cars 100 years ago on the planet. Now there's 1.3 billion, right? So we have a whole lot of passengers. Replacement rate in a population is 2.1 children per childbearing woman. It used to be childless couple in America. Oh, they're so self-indulgent. They're selfish. Flip it, right? Flip the tax code. For every year you are married and don't have a child, you get a $5,000 tax deduction. If you have a child, you gotta pay for it because you're bringing a dependent in onto the spaceship that can't operate for crew for a number of years. And they're putting out not 16 tons, but two or three tons on their own. So if you bring more than two children onto the spaceship, you know, you have to, you have to really be crew to support that. So, you know, I, think about 7.3, we're gonna be 9 billion, somewhere around 2045, and maybe 10 billion by 2050. The apocalyptic uh, climate scientists say, if we don't change, there'll be at best 3 billion people on the planet by 2100 because of the wars, over hunger, starvation, sea level rise, endless drought, uh, no water, things like that, right? So bringing a passenger onto the spaceship you have to own the responsibility of that. It's a difficult conversation, I know. Renewable energy technologies, not extraction. For years, I have been saying alternative and renewable energies is the single greatest wealth creation opportunity in the history of humanity. Why? Because six billion people use a product, fossil fuels, that has to be replaced in 30 years. Never before has there been an opportunity an economic opportunity to replace a product that six billion people use. So, you know, that's what Silicon Valley should be doing. We don't need any more social apps, right? This, you know, this conference has largely been about community and innovation. There's no larger community than the spaceship Earth, 
and there's no important place to focus all the innovation than the, the survival of civilization. Atmospheric cleansing. Um, I wrote about this in 2012. We have to take it out. This is my pitch when I get to Silicon Valley, okay? Because there is technology in place now where there's a tower, we first found it on Kickstarter, you know, it's about three stories high, it's about 15 feet in diameter, you put it in a plaza of, of a community and it completely clears that plaza of particulates, right? And then there's all kinds of other ones. So the, by 2020, hopefully we'll have this, and it, how rich can someone become to create a technology that saves humanity, right? So that's the, that's the moonshot. Develop a global systems approach to energy, agriculture, and emissions. We gotta be real about it, right? We, the United States, can get off of fossil fuels faster than most other people. Denmark is 60% of the way there. New Zealand is 90% non-fossil fuels. <clears throat> So we have to look at it as a whole since everybody's downstream or downwind from somebody else and say, okay, so Europe and the United States and, North and Canada can, can, can be off, whereas Indonesia, it might take longer. So we're managing a global systems perspective on, on the fossil fuel, which will go to 2050. So we have to look at it as a holistic, systematic approach for everything. We have to redefine work. Was it God? Who, who was it that said people have to work nine to five Monday through Friday? I missed that. That went into effect 100 years ago for the factory. Three shifts, bell rings. It makes no sense today. Working from home makes more sense. As Tim said, rush hour is the greatest misnomer in human history, right? It's stop and go hour. It's not rush hour. So we have to redefine work. If we redefine work, we can immediately cut carbon emissions. Who, you know, I don't care what kind of company you have, unless it's a service company, you have to be there. And that'll be replaced soon by robots anyway. Um, you know, maybe Tuesday and Thursday, everybody has to be in for the meetings. And everybody else works from home, right? <clears throat> and we have to plan for strategic retreat. And I'm gonna go into sea level rise in a minute. Strategic retreat. Remember I talked about the refugees. The slides I'm about to show you are about sea level rise, okay? Where are 35 million Bangladeshis gonna go in the next 20 years? Because where they live now will be underwater. Where will the population of Miami have to go by 2050? Because Miami will be underwater. In some of these extreme projections that are happening now, there will not be a Manhattan by 2060. Okay, so we got to start thinking about that because if we don't start thinking about it now, it's going to happen unto us. Where are these, where, where are 60, you know, look at a map of Asia tonight and find where 35 million Bangladeshis are going to be able to go between now and 2035. Okay, so to make it local, uh, sea level rise. We're near a body of water. The forecasts keep changing as we are now getting feedback. So here's the significant thing. Remember, this is an under, unprecedented occurrence that we have never had, okay? So we don't know how to predict it. So the scientists are doing their best and they do a linear projection and then they do an arithmetic projection. But now we're getting feedback from the planet that we were wrong. What was, what was the worst case forecast in 1990 for 2040? By, all, by the smartest climate scientists in the world, is happening now. Because the feedback loop is showing us when the ice melts in the Arctic, okay, it used to be ice that reflected heat, and then it melted, so it gave more of a surface to the Earth to absorb heat, which then increased the ice melt because it was warming up more there. So we didn't factor that in. So, so it's starting to change. <clears throat> The conservative forecasts, the conservative forecasts today are that there'll be a two to five foot sea level rise by 2050. So when I talk to the, the students at Ringling, I say, this is gonna happen by the time you're 60, okay? 
<clears throat> now, <clears throat> think about that for Florida. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's the most valuable real estate in the state of Florida? <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so the line that the people... <clears throat> Sorry for this. The line, I, it, it's the, I slept with the window open and there's a lot of air, uh, tree stuff in the air, I guess. Um, I borrowed this from climatologists in Miami. The normal investing is buy low, sell high. The new phrase is sell low, buy high. So stay with my thinking. I explained this to Jonathan and his land use attorneys a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> If it's a given that there will not be an Anna Maria Island or any beaches in Florida by 2040, what's going to happen? When is that awareness going to kick in? So you have a $3 million mansion that is at sea level or a foot above sea level. When will it become fraud for a real estate agent in, sometime in the 2020s to sell beachfront property without the disclosure that probably won't be there in 15 years, right? When that consciousness clicks in that, my God, you know, then it will become like a flood zone in terms of the insurance companies. If anybody, if there's any industry that understands climate change, it's the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry, right? So they're going to they're gonna say, well, wait a minute, we're not going to insure something that's not going to be here in 15 years. We'll give you a 10-year mortgage. In fact, we're not going to give you a mortgage. Or what if you have a 30-year mortgage? The bank's going to call the mortgage because there's no asset that, you know, for the mortgage. So what will happen? There's going to be a precedent preceding that sea level rise. There's going to be, I better sell my property while I can. So a whole lot of trickle effects are going to start to occur in the state of Florida because of that. <clears throat> James Hansen, former head of, the N, of, of NASA. So he's one of those guys. He's not a quack. He's one of those guys. He came out last year and said that he and a few other guys, this hasn't been fully vetted, and it's so, out of, it's so out of our ability to put in our consciousness that it's being challenged, but all these other ones were challenged as well. He is saying that the upper end could well be 10 feet by 2060. If I was giving this speech on this stage in 2060, I'd be underwater, right? So if you have kids, this is important. If you're 70, it's not an issue for you personally, right? So now this next slide was taken in Sarasota in 2013, right, Tim? So three years ago, <clears throat> there's a thing called a king tide in Florida, and it happens once a year in Sarasota, right, Tim, once a year? Okay, so this was once a year. So over here, you see a woman in regular low tide, standing on her dock. Those are her feet. Those are her knees. Now, if you live in this part of Florida, this type of thing is very familiar to you, right? It's that wall, you know, for the bayous and stuff. Look at the wall there. That was three years ago at high tide, right? So factor in a foot sea level rise and then factor in tides on top of that. So this won the prize. So there was obviously a photo prize for, from the Herald Tribune. Take the best picture of the king tide. So it's already in the awareness back in 2013. So this is Sarasota and Bradenton. I mean, that was three years ago. Look at that. <clap> I'm not being apocalyptic. I'm just speaking what, with certainty here, okay? so. What is this? Somebody tell me what this is. Anything, anybody? Of what? Okay. Every, nobody else took geography? That only one guy had the right answer? <clears throat> or did the rest of you sense it's a trick question, right? This is the map of the political world, right? This is Spaceship Earth. This is the map of the human concept of nation states. That's, this doesn't have anything to do with planet Earth. This is a map of the concept of nation states. It's a human concept. When the monarch butterfly migrates from Canada down to Mexico, 
Do you think he knows what country he's in? Right? He, uh, sorry, he, she, I don't know. Um, so, so this is how we think of the earth, and this is the way we need to think of it, as this spaceship earth, as the only place we have. So for time, for time going forward into infinity, until we can colonize Mars in a couple of centuries with any critical mass of people, what we have in the planet, on the planet, in space and around is all we have to live with for the rest of the lives of the next five generations. That's why climate change has to be on top. That's why you have to have crew consciousness, right? You have to have crew consciousness. So I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna thank you. Um, we're about ready, this, this is the nonprofit we don't have our donation page up yet, but you can go there and start learning about it. And, and um, it will be up the first week in March, so week after next. And uh, my goal is to travel the world to talk about this, to get individual funding, to find corporations for whom this is an alignment that's of value, get those corporations to commit to do something, so we'll take their donation. We're not gonna take the donation of anybody who wants to give us a check. We're gonna, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have logos up on that website where if you scroll over it, it'll scroll down and say, this is what the company has committed to do relative to crew consciousness. So it's not just give us money so we can do our thing, it's make a difference. And, and we're not gonna give you a mug, we're gonna give you a free download to this book for every $5 you donate so that you can spread the word. Tim and I are interested in making money off the book, though we will make some money off it. We want, you know, if I can use corporations, if I can use big entities, and I can get five million people, we can get five million people to read this book in the next year, we got a shot, right? So we're committed to changing consciousness, and with that, I thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>